I'm, hello, I'm Ari, your host at Episteme Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to, to entrepreneurs and tech startups that will change our lives. Today, uh, our guest is a visionaire, an innovator, Amir Bozogzadeh, serial tech entrepreneur and current, currently co-founder and CEO at Virtu, Virtuleap, a startup based in uh, headquartered in uh, Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, founded in 2018, Virtuleap develops and offers neuro neuroscience backed virtual reality solution to improve your brain, your brain health and cognitive capacities. Nice to have you, Amir. How are you today? Thank you for having me, Ari. I'm very excited to share the spotlight with you today. It's a real pleasure to have you uh, uh, because what you do is very interesting and uh, um, very innovative. Uh, and, uh, and, and I really wanted to have you and this, to have this discussion together about uh, about uh, Virtuleap. But before we talk uh, about Virtuleap, uh, I would like to, to, to get you know better. Uh, maybe if you can tell us about your backstory, uh, we want to understand where and why uh, the fire entrepreneurship and innovation have emerged in you. Uh, what, what were your family and what was your, your path, your, your studies and how you, you, you ended to become a virtual reality leader? Sure, I'm. I'm the you know first generation immigrant uh, from Iran. Uh, grew up in, in Vancouver, Canada. I trained uh, initially uh, for the first five years of my career in market research, and particularly as a quantitative researcher, uh, hundreds and hundreds of surveys and and uh, trying to quantify uh, the the human condition with statistics and and, and large samples. Uh, very different from from the life of a qualitative researcher that kind of looks at the individual persona in and of itself. Um, but that gave me a lot of appreciation for what can be done with, with uh, um, large scale data and the types of uh, opportunities that just don't even run across only marketing and, and these types of corporate interests, but goes into psychological um, typologies and, and various interests that I've, I've always been very, very keen on studying, even as a layman, uh, things like uh, the MBTI, uh, inspired from uh, Carl Jung to the big five personality types. I've always been a, quite a bit of a junkie when it comes to um, anything that goes into psychometrics um, and understanding the human condition in terms of um, the various caricatures that we are. My career, however, um, went from market research to games publishing um, and, and uh, also a launched social impact company in Dubai where I was spending about eight years of my, of my life um, kind of being in both sectors of trying to figure out how to you bring in and merge uh, the gaming um, world with that of social impact, which has always been something um, I've been trying to wrap my head around. How, how do you create like a, a, a sort of compelling social impact company leveraging technology that can actually endure? And I, I did a company called Time uh, Durham in Dubai for some years. And it's, it's based on the concept of time banking um, in which you can be able to create an economy of, of people in a community exchanging each other's time um, and services. Um, by the time I had uh, decided to leave Dubai, I, it was exactly the same time that I started writing for VentureBeat and TechCrunch and specifically on the area of VR. And, and AR, but virtual reality was something that I was very keen on in particular because it seemed to have certain features that were very unique um, to a technology in, in so far as virtual reality. Um, and I was writing lots of articles for about three to four years, um, not making any, any dollars off it, by the way, really just trying to spend a, a good period of time just understanding um, by, by interviewing um, industry leaders across various sectors in VR, uh, applying it for all sorts of use cases from automotive to sports to um, where I have uh, eventually landed my own kind of stake is in, the, in the, the intersection of VR and neuroscience. Around 2018, I had decided to uh, incorporate Virtually. We based it out of Lisbon, Portugal. And it's essentially the, the brainchild of what I, what I realized after writing so many articles um, and, and researching the industry for so long that my understanding of virtual reality's critical use case is, is right the intersection of, of the education and, and healthcare sectors, and particularly in leveraging the neuroscience research. And that's when I started uh, Virtual Leap and I have been building it uh, up ever since. 
Um, so um, you, you, you talk a little bit uh, about your path and and uh, and the startup you, you you launched before. I would like just to to, to come back to, to to the first one you launched in Dubai. Uh, how is it to, to launch a startup in Dubai? I mean, uh, your your the service you offered was for the Middle Eastern people, and uh, I, I guess, or it was something very open to 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 the planet. Or how was yeah. it? How, how 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 it is to launch a startup in Dubai in terms of building the community and uh, because there are many nationalities at the same time. So mm -hmm. how is it? Well, you know, Dubai is a very transient uh, community. Uh, Um, I think everyone who who comes in and out of Dubai, you don't really know how long someone's going to be there. If you make a friendship, will that friendship even be able to last uh, more than six months because people are going up, uh, in and out? Um, it makes a quite challenging environment for any sort of time bank uh, um, concept that's all about building um, lasting community connections. It, however, it, it was where I was based, and it was a concept of if it can uh, if it can work there, then it can work anywhere anywhere. Um, it uh, was a, a venture that was very challenging for all the reasons you're kind of hinting at right now. The, you know, the, I, it, there's probably nowhere in the world that's, that's multicultural as Dubai in some, some extent. Perhaps, I think maybe Brussels and, and Belgium in general has, has uh, maybe see, I've seen it to be a, a somewhat similar. But um, in Dubai, because of the transience, because of the, the level of, I suppose, capitalism that is so highlighted there, Um, in terms of the job market, it makes things much more challenging. I, I, you know, have to say that running a startup anywhere is always challenging. And then if you try to put a social impact startup, it's even more challenging than anything else because venture capital is harder to come by. At least it was in, in those days. The things have changed quite considerably since then. Um, but it was, it was challenging at all, at all costs because a lot of the cultures didn't want to um, interconnect in the way that I was trying to promote. It, it would be uh, people selectively choosing their own kind of, I think, ethnic biases and, and these kinds of things. Um, uh, some, you know, percentage of, 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 of your community will always be very experimental more than others, but it wasn't a large enough uh, base of the champion users to, to make it something that was really working out, especially the, 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 the citizens of the UAE, the Emiratis were very difficult to get them to participate. So it was, it was really just the expat community that would, would participate, the ex, um, everyone else to, as far as the Emiratis. Um, I don't think we had a single user um, who was an Emirati that actually um, even exchanged one time Durham. I think uh, the, this uh, complexity of the Middle East market is even even more more important than the one in Europe because usually in Europe we say okay European is uh, is, a, is a continent uh, they, they share a common culture with a big sea and a common civilization but at the end you have Portugal they, sp they speak Spanish they sp sorry they speak Portuguese they have their own law you have the Spain they, 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 they speak Spanish they have their own, their own law you have French We have France and, and the French with their culture and their law, you know, and it's very complicated to have a service that could that could diffuse, you know, to all Europe very fast, like just mm. in the USA or in the Canada, because they have they, they share the, the the English language, the, mm. the, they have the same law everywhere. Of course, uh, even the uh, United States, it's a, it's um there are many states, but they they have a common law, so uh, the diffusion of innovation are very faster in in US than in Europe for mm. that. But in Middle East, I think it's even more complicated because if you launch a startup in Dubai, you have to to bring uh, as a user or client the the, the Dubaiot, uh, who are not the same than the Saudi. They are not mm. the same than the Iraqi. They are not the same than the Jordan. So uh, even they they speak Arabic, but they don't have the same culture. You know, so it's very it's even more difficult to to spread the innovation and and of course Iran is which is, is a little is nearly another word. You know, for 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 innovation and and the mentality and the culture. Sure. So I can understand uh, how much is was challenging uh, to launch a startup there. And what about the talent uh, in Dubai? You can, could could you find engineer? Or, a designer or marketer easily in Dubai? Well, I mean, your question uh, is hard to answer, to be honest. I, I suppose uh, uh, no more than anywhere else. It depends on what your proposition is and how attractive it is and your, your, the funding you have. Uh, I, I've seen plenty of companies uh, of similar types and breeds 
in Dubai uh, go through the same more or less pattern of cycle of, of running a startup as anywhere else. Um, it depends who you are as a founder, um, how compelling you are as a, as a communicator um, to get that talent. In terms of the numbers of people there, if you're, if you're mentioning like the quantities of developers and the like, um, I don't remember it being scarce. Uh, I think uh, finding good talent is always very difficult in any market. Um, Dubai might be quite uh, challenging in some respects, but so is Portugal. Um, uh, I, I've always faced, uh, I've always approached uh, running a startup of any kind, and it's so varied in the wide range of all the companies I've seen, especially covering them and encountering them as a, as a journalist. Um, you just have to be ready to pivot continuously and find how the market is responding to your idea and let the market whisper to you how to adjust your plan and adjust your concept in order to um, fit into the market conditions. Um, you know, if there is a challenge with developers, finding developers, if there's a challenge with finding certain groups of people, then perhaps you go into more of a remote, a remote uh, working sort of model. Um, there's always a, a if there's a will, there's always a way is really a, a true cliche. Um, but I can't say that uh, launching the startup in Dubai had any particular restrictions that are overwhelming. If, if you can get any other ingredients like investor backing, governmental support, all these kind of things factor in and a, a founder's ability to know what, what, what support is there, non-dilutive capital, um, partnerships that can be paid partnerships at, at, at any stage. Um, we were able to work quite closely with the Community Development Authority, which is an arm of the Dubai government. And they were very, very pleasant to work with, um, you know, despite all the challenges. So there's a lot of benefits and, and, of and things that you can get there. Of course. So thanks for this um, introduction, Amir. Now uh, I have uh, my friend Tahere Pazuki, who, has joined, who is joining us. Uh, Tahere is... Um... Hello, Tahere. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Hi, Ari. Hi, Amir. Nice to see you both. Nice to meet you. Um, do you want me to introduce you or you you prefer me to, to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, to give a short introduction. So I'm Tahere, uh, founder and CEO of Magrid. And it's also somehow, I guess, we sharing the, the, the problems we're trying to solve. So Magrid is also about uh, training cognitive abilities, but uh, more for uh like the different age range probably we are targeting uh, young children and uh, children with a special education needs and uh, uh yeah i'm based in luxembourg um so the solution has been implemented in all public schools in luxembourg and now we are like expanding our um, second market is Portugal, and now I'm currently in Lisbon. I thought I would get to meet you, Amir, as I saw that <laughs> you established um, the entity in uh, in Portugal. But um, if I may also, uh, Ari, intervene, I had some questions. Of course. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering if you also like working in Portugal market or you only established the business there? And if only establishing the business, why, why did you make this choice? So our headquarters is based in Portugal because um, for a few factors, and some of them are, are strategic and some of them are selfish. Um, I was writing about many ecosystems, not just specifically virtual reality, but startup ecosystems when I was writing for VentureBeat and TechCrunch. And I had written about four or so articles about the startup ecosystem in Portugal. I like you know, new and upcoming uh, startup ecosystems. I would say the primary factor for basing ourselves there was the, the you know, relatively low cost of the talent. Um, mm -hmm. For a virtual reality oriented company that is not at that point focused on gaming. And in 2018, it was considered a gaming platform, not a serious gaming or, or serious use case for therapeutics and digital medicine and all these kinds of areas that have now become so trending since the pandemic, especially. But at that time, you struggled, especially if you're not US based as a founder in Europe, um, funding is very, very hard to come by for these kinds of use cases that leverage emerging technologies like VR. So we needed to have a place where potentially we could hire two or three or four developers for the cost of one in um, Silicon Valley or, or even the UK. 
um, and that was our primary motive. I would say that uh, Portugal has a lot of surprises, negative uh, and, and bad, uh, and, and very hurtful for a startup ecosystem um, that founders should be very, very cautious of. Uh, one of those things is that the accounting and taxation system in, in Portugal doesn't understand uh, what a startup is. Um, it doesn't understand why a business should be actively running without a, po a positive cash flow. Um, so it doesn't understand the whole idea of raising capital and then being uh, not profitable on purpose. Uh, so that's a big problem, uh, a huge one. And it's, um, it actually um, makes you ineligible for a lot of R&D sort of tax schemes and, and incentives because they don't get it. Um, and their system is so, I'm going to watch my words here. Uh, they have a lot of challenges. Um, they need to update themselves. And, the, you know, there's always in any market, there's always these um, champions of the ecosystem, these people who, you know, are like trying to show that this is the next up and coming, you know, they even said it themselves, Berlin or, or, or Barcelona, or, you know, whenever you see something like that, it's more about a hype driven um, ecosystem which is fine at one stage, but really people should be aware any potential startup founders, if you're an early stage or pre-seed startup, um, it's a very, very um, threatening place to start your startup. If you're like a Microsoft or a, you know, a major call center, of course, you're not, a, you're not a startup, you're a established business with Excel sheets that can show that you're a very predictable business model. But for a startup of our stage, and especially a research-driven, science-driven one that is trying to uh, impact the world with bleeding edge um, you know, intersection of neuroscience and technology, uh, it's, it's not the place to be. I, I don't regret doing it, but I, I would, I would never want to, um, uh, pretend like it was a joy ride. The quality of life is also nice in Portugal. And not for the Portuguese, some of them, I'll tell you that, you know, um, the, the government there, uh, has really let, you know, models like Airbnb just shoot the prices of the real estate up so high. I mean, go check out the minimum wage of, of Portuguese. And, you know, this is something we say the quality of life is great for expats coming in and ruining their market. So, I mean, it depends how you want to look at it. Yeah, I, I, I live pretty, pretty well being there. I live pretty well here in Barcelona, too. And in Barcelona, there's more government measures to protect the people. I think in France, if you try to do some of the things the Portuguese government does in, uh, to its population, um, in France, you know, they, they blow up cars if you bring up the prices of bananas, you know, like uh, <laughs> there's a very high taxation system in Portugal, and yet they still pay so many things on top of that. Um, in, unlike Spain, where basically no one pretty much wants private health care insurance because the public system takes care of everyone uh, for the price they pay through their taxes. In Portugal, you pretty much need private uh, health insurance. I could go on for, for hours. Um, about this stuff, um, there I, I just don't like to be a hype person. You know, I I I have I have too many friends of that ecosystem who suffer, um, and and there, I don't really know if there's actually a benefit from overhyping um, economies. Yes, the weather's great, the food is great, and I totally agree with that. No, no, thank you because it's very important to to give uh, the fact about uh, location because startup is so 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 hard, so challenging. So we it, the information you shared is very important and and uh, very useful. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, so let's let's talk about virtually now uh, the story of virtually how. Do you position, you talk about that you were already passionate about virtual reality at the same time neuroscience and you, there was something in your head how to connect these two worlds. But uh, concretely, uh, we want to, to, to hear your story, how you, 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 how you meet, uh, how you met your co-founder, how you put the idea on the table, how you identify the problem, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, Sure. So, I mean, we, we started off in 2018 trying to enter the education and healthcare sectors, but from a point of view of, of, of accessing some of the, the, the dormant, but really highly impactful potential of the technology. For example, virtual reality is the first embodied digital format. You know, you, can, you have um, the smartphones in your pocket, but these are actually quite alien technologies. You, you, you have to learn how to use their UX. You know, one of the things is teaching really great and building really great UXs. In virtual reality, if you create it right, it's an imitation of the real world. So picking up a, a bottle of, uh, of Coke or, or some drink, uh, it's the same thing, same dynamics. You know, if you design VR properly with, with all those kind of factors in play and proper 
accessibly design, then it's something that's intuitive for someone who's 70 years old. And that's the huge opportunity is that everybody can use this technology. Everyone can understand it. My last article on VentureBeat in 2019 was in fact the surprising observation that senior um, populations, the nursing homes, they're actually, at least in the US and, and a lot of places in, in Europe, they're early adopters of virtual reality um, because it is so intuitive to use. Um, but in 2018, we had launched initially as, as a company that wanted to use neuroscience research to create what we call biometric algorithms. Um, these algorithms that would be able to understand your emotional state, how comfortable you are, uncomfortable you are based on your body language. Because mm -hmm. VR systems are so, um, they're so profound in what they track. And of course, the data uh, privacy issues of, of late um, with how some companies leverage that data is, is definitely a concern we um, acknowledge. But the data is also like a superpower if you use it in the, in the purpose of, of healthcare and education and training. Um, so we see it really on the other side of the, the equation of all the potential that if, if someone can use their data in a very responsible way, there's so many ways to transcend the human condition. Um, and so we were trying to create these algorithms that would be able to create data analytics that could give us the insight about the human condition to be able to help us overcome challenges, learning challenges in particular. During that process, about a year into it, we had been creating these uh, game, gamified environments to test our algorithms. And that was what uh, ultimately um, uh, made us realize that the actual games, which were basically gamified neuropsychological assessment tools, they you know, were more of an opportunity or a more practical opportunity to pivot to. And so we pivoted from the algorithm creation to the neuropsychological assessment tools that we would gamify into these embodied um, environments. And for the last two and a half years upon that kind of pivot, we built up a library of 15 of these very unique exercises, each one of it, which tests and trains a specific cognitive function, uh, like short-term memory, uh, long-term memory, working memory, information processing, problem solving, uh, speed and attention skills, but also because of the embodiment of virtual reality also, spatial orientation, motor control skills, spatial audio awareness. And uh, you know, last week, or <clears throat> sorry, uh, two weeks ago, we, we published our first uh, peer-reviewed paper in sorry, the Frontiers. So, sorry to interrupt you. I would like to ask a, a question from someone who, uh, let's say, is not a neuroscientist. Sure. Even though sure. I'm a former biologist, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of time has spent the past, and I, I would like to, to, to ask a very naive question. You know, I remember that when we talk about memory, uh, and training uh, about memory. Uh, for example, if I train to, to memorize words, uh, I will train my memory to memorize words, but I don't train my memory in general, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, is your, uh, is, is the solution you, you, you develop, you invented, is a general, uh, uh, could, could improve in general my memory? Because I mean, you, you propose a specific kind of test but will I um, improve my memory to your specific type of uh, things or for everything? I don't know if I'm clear. Uh, so these 15 um, cognitive exercises, they're, they're, they're supposed to be used as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. They're very short form closed loop games, which basically means that it's like an, it's a, a really good analogy is like going to the gym for your physical body and you have, you have, you have, um, you have uh, equipment for the upper body exercises and you have equipment for the lower body, but you have the abs, you know, you have the arms, you have the triceps, you have the shoulders, and each one is specifically training that, that one particular area. Now, someone at a, at a gym would probably say, you come in and you're going to use all these instruments ideally so you can develop a wholesomeness and, and train. And, and basically, you're also testing at the very same time um, those various muscles. It's the same thing with what we've created. It could be considered a gym for the mind. So those 15 games that are uh, testing different areas, they're not supposed to be specifically only use one. You have to, every time you log in, for example, um, we're available on the B2C um, VR stores. Every time you log in, you, you play uh, uh, three games, um, uh, which is a 10 to 15 minute session. So, and that's your daily cognitive workout. And then the whole idea is for you to come in regularly, once, twice, uh, maybe every day, if you're so inclined. And, and just like the gym for your body, you, you basically use this to, monitor your cognitive performance um, and you get to uh, test and train different cognitive functions. Now, whether it's monitoring or actually improving, I you know, can't say too much because 
<clears throat> a company like us, we have partners that are doing studies to prove that independently of the technology provider. And we can never put the cart before the horse, but for, for sure, the, the therapeutic applications are, are the most exciting. It's for you know the same area. I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a company called Killy Interactive. About a couple of years ago in Boston, this company has been trailblazing for 10 years under the scientific leadership of Adam Ghazali, who's a pioneer of, of, uh, of gamified uh, neuropsychological assessment tools. Um, they had been awarded breakthrough designation by the FDA as the first game as medicine. Their video game has been is now a prescribable solution by doctors for children eight to twelve years of age that have ADHD. So their games are their game uh, is designed based on the same principles that our fifteen games are designed for, and they are for the use of the general population or by people who have ADHD, people who are rehabilitating from a. Uh, uh, a traumatic brain injury, someone who is who is doing chemotherapy and has a memory fog because of it, someone who has long COVID, someone who uh, is an athlete who has a concussion, um, or or the biggest uh, area that we're very specifically focused on, uh, Alzheimer's, and and how to detect cognitive deterioration um, perhaps decades before it ever onset, so that you can proactively um, change. Uh, you know, your habits and your lifestyle in order to hopefully um, hand, hand in hand with a neurologist and, you know, proper clinicians and doctors and GPs um, work to, to steer away or at least extend your, your longevity as, as much as possible. So we're very focused in terms of our B2B relationships with very specific, um, you know, therapeutic areas. But also this tool is publicly available. We have over 42,000 early registered users, you know, about 50 to 150 people register every day. It's available in four languages, uh, Mandarin, Chinese, uh, Spanish, or well, European, Spanish, European, Portuguese, and English. And we'll have Japanese, Dutch, German, French, um, uh, all localized uh, by the end of this year. So uh, if I want to, to use the, the one uh, for, for, for the general public, I need to buy a, a Oculus, right? Uh, they've renamed themselves, unfortunately, to the Meta. So it's called Meta Quest now. Mm -hmm. Oculus has been disbanded as a name. Um, so, but yes, correct. You would get the, um, Oc uh, the Meta Quest too. I almost did it myself. Um, it's a $300 device. I think in Europe, it's a little bit more, $340. Uh, if you uh, buy it through your business, I think on Amazon, you can probably get rid of the VAT and it's about $280. So. Sorry, if you have questions, do, do not hesitate to interrupt me because you know how worthy I am. So do not hesitate to interrupt me if you have any questions. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, I had uh, some more business-related questions. I wanted to better understand who's exactly the beneficiaries and uh, who like the target uh, population who would be using the product and who are the customers because I think you mentioned B2B so like uh, who exactly would be like buying the product so we we um we're making money right now since summer of last year when we kind of came out of stealth and we decided to start commercializing we made about 1.5 million initial licensing agreements with companies like Penumbra which is like um, a healthcare oriented company that sells directly to uh, hospitals. Um, so they license our solution as, a, as part of their VR portfolio for, for use cases like people with stroke and they need to be rehabilitated from that condition. Um, we also have active clinical studies and we consider our clinical partners of those studies where grants are the source of the funds. They, we consider them our clients too um, because eventually we think that uh, those types of clinical trials will transition into licensing uh, relationships. Our main partnerships on the B2B side are really those. It's, it's commercial partners that want to use us for rehabilitation, for training, for education. I mean, we're, we're, being, um, we're receiving emails from private high schools that want to use us in, in K-12 uh, curriculums as the gym for the mind, the sort of PE for cognition. Um, but we make our, our content available for free um, to the general population. They just don't have access to our backend solutions and all the data tools that are possible for research purposes and community management. Um, we want to pilot with Roche Portugal, uh, where you are right now um, in Lisbon, which will be, getting, will be beginning in the next few weeks. And their focus is for dementia and being able to use one of our, our companion applications. We have a, a thing called the remote control that allows a clinician to remote navigate the VR experience 
um, you know, without that person having been in the same room, they can just do it all telehealth. And that's what the pilot's for. Um, so, you know, we're in a stage right now that a lot of companies like us in the deep tech, deep tech space, we, they call it, or we call it uh, purgatory, uh, pilot purgatory, which is, you know, um, just spending a couple of years figuring out what is our business models, what are the main sectors, because it's really agnostic. I mean, insurance companies are interested to work with us. Um, uh, corporations with human performance programs for their HR are looking, uh, looking to work with us. We're piloting our solution with the Divide Future Foundation, for example, that's applying it to their, their workforce. Um, we have a couple of pi pilots uh, about to begin in Japan, um, and particularly with senior living uh, networks. So, you know, it's a period of time where we can make money in certain areas, but we don't have a very uh, standardized uh, pricing model. So it's like you are more uh, reactive, let's say, rather than proactive. I would say we're exploratory. Um, I would say that we are we're open minded. I would say that um, we're resistant to the 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 type of um, Silicon Valley copy and paste model that everyone's doing. I don't think I don't agree with the the applying the same strategy and approaches to business as a company that sells hot dogs online as a company that is trying to um, address uh, Alzheimer's disease. Mm. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Um, just to, 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 to continue the question about the client. Um, so do, how do you deliver, I mean, your service to, to your B2B uh, client? Uh, do, you, do you offer them a package with the, with the, with the device or, or they have to buy the device separately? Uh, I mean, the, the, the glass, of course, the yeah. ability. Well, you know, like about four years ago, I would say that you have to have like a, you know, all in one package, you know, you, you'd have to give one that you give a, you know, preloaded headset and so on. Um, luckily, there's a lot of companies that already do that. And so we get, we get reached out by companies that already have the headsets and they're looking for expanding their content. Um, so for example, nursing homes in the U.S. are a very hot market right now for VR. And there's a bunch of companies that are quite, you know, the leaders out there for, you know, social isolation, addressing it, um, creating environments for people to be able to escape um, when they're in the pandemic and they're socially isolated 24 seven, which accelerates dementia. We, they want, now that they have these headsets there, they want other content, they want other solutions. And so they reach out to us to, you know, provide another content that, that adds value for their communities. So for the most part, we never sell to anybody or approach any, any companies that don't already use VR. This is very interesting. That, that means that uh, um, VR as, as a device has, has started to, to diffuse into the company, right? Yeah. Now there are companies who are company or organization, public or private that are already equipped uh, with this device, just like computer or, or laptop or, or smartphone, right? Well, I would, I would say the consumer market is not mainstream. It's always being propped up um, and incentivized and, and hyped up. And we don't know how many headsets are actually being used after two months or how many are collecting dust after six months. Um, consumer market is very, very scary in my point of view. Um, it's when we go, go to serious use cases like training um, of, of training, not just, you know, athletes, for example, with some solutions, but even NASA is interested in VR for like these astronauts heading to Mars and all the different challenges that they have and how technology can kind of come in and help uh, overcome those challenges. Um, the serious use cases of medical and healthcare that I'm connected to, you can see companies now being funded that are addressing education uh, as a sector. Uh, one company called Prisms of Reality just got a $4.25 million investment that was announced last week or the week before, um, led by Anderson Horowitz, probably the most famous of, of VCs out there. So, so you can see all these particular, very serious uh, use cases and uh, companies um, using it in a way that does seem to be coming mainstream. I still have my, my worries about those kind of use cases only because the hardware iteration is so fast when it comes to VR. Like every six months at one point, uh, another hardware would come out that made the other one kind of, um, you know, uh, embarrassing to use because the evolution is just so fast. You want to update to the next one. Luckily, because of the, you know, and the subsidization of the hardware that the, um, that Meta 
is putting into the uh, into play the headsets are also becoming cheaper and cheaper so it was like 600 bucks let's say a few years ago or 800 bucks now it's 300 um there's a lot of there's a lot of activity in making it more comfortable making it lighter making it higher resolution in terms of the, not just in the in terms of the the visual aspect but also you know all sorts of you know other types of technologies that makes it more multi-sensory and more compelling uh for for all these use cases i think hopefully in in the next year or two we'll see apple enter the scene and that will change things very very much i think uh i i think Tari, you 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 are you told me that you you want to ask amir about also um, the benefits <laughs> of the 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 the, the program uh, for 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 the user uh, yeah but i think he, he already explained so oh, sorry yeah, i missed that point. okay yeah uh yeah on the so that's that's totally clear now for me okay perfect sorry <laughs> no 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 thanks for uh, taking care of that uh so okay um what can i say uh all right but um let's talk about your innovation model um how do you um do you have right now a complete uh, operating staff of engineer, designer, or marketers, or do you outsource a part of your innovation process? How how do you work in the, in the in the in the in the in your in your in the cooking oven, you know, of innovation? Yeah. But we don't. Um, I suppose the way I kind of learned how to operate um, a startup in general is that investors hate uh, when you outsource anything. Uh, so we've never outsourced uh, our content creation. It makes things a little bit harder in some ways but at least all the ip or know-how stays within the company especially if you're not able to patent anything or protect any of your you know your intellectual property um so to speak it's really all in the, the technology and it's not none of the know-how or that that uh, secret sauce is in the hands of any company outside um of, of yours um so everything's been created in terms of you know the neuroscientist that initially designs the research and the roadmap of what needs to be gamified into one of our you know, cognitive exercises, then um, she, in this case, works with our technical game designer to then you know, gamify it into a compelling experience that maintains the, the priority of the science and the, and the data quality and all those things above whatever it is that makes it fun um, or interesting. Um, and then that technical game designer, once that's agreed with the roadmap, will now coordinate with the game developers, which we develop everything in Unity. Uh, basically the most popular game engine for virtual reality. Two thirds of the market is developed in Unity. One third or so, maybe it's more now, um, is with Unreal Engine. Um, and so the technical game designer with the liaison of the neuroscientist throughout the whole process of creating an alpha version, a beta version, and releasing that product, uh, that, that additional exercise into the overall application that's called Enhanced VR, um, along with the, you know, a designated person who is taking care of QA and, and testing of the application. They all work together quite in a multidisciplinary environment, um, all the way to releasing it, the, it as a beta um, to our public server and making getting a lot of feedback for a while, seeing how the game is being played, how the scoring is is coming in, uh, any any glitches, any issues, really really smooth lining all that process before we you know declare that that exercise a, a full fledged. Uh, member of the library of, of exercises great so everything is uh is um uh, is inside your wall and you have uh, you have all the talent uh the key the key talent you need so that this is very great and important um we talk we talk about a little bit about zuckerberg and his and the metaverse and how he put you know uh his his, his influence money also on the table on the, for, for to develop the metaverse but what about, uh, let's say, Elon Musk and his Neuralink? Do you see any connection with uh, what he is doing right now with Neuralink and the virtual reality and what you do virtually? Well, I mean, Neuralink is an um, interesting kind of approach to, you know, BCI and computer interfaces that can ultimately, you know, be used to do all sorts of wonders. Um, I, I don't see the immediate connection in the near term, in the short term. With virtual reality, but ultimately that kind of technology would probably be a better way to um, inject someone into a virtual reality environment that's more along the lines of what we see in the Matrix. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not a you don't put goggles in in the Matrix, and I think that's the kind of virtual reality people want is when you hijack um, directly to the brain um, 
all those kind of inputs so that you're actually in an environment in a more natural native way. Um, I, I'm glad if I don't live long enough to see that because I <laughs> don't really want to be around for that stuff. But, um, but like, you know, BCI can probably have an, have a, a sort of, you know, relationship with even the VR of current um, form and format if it were to be, for example, interconnected in a way that can engage other senses, like let's say the, the sense of smell um, or, or auditory and, and some of these other things, maybe not the visual sense completely, but maybe you can also engage that way, hijack the systems that otherwise would be really awkward. And with a multi-sensory platform like VR, you can really only do the visual sense. Mm -hmm. You know, everything else is kind of awkward to add in. You can't really bring in smells. Like what are you gonna do? Like just perfume yourself um, with, with some kind of additional add-on. I just find that hard to believe. So maybe Neuralink can come in to connect um, other, other senses into the VR experience because connecting the visual sense through Neuralink, um, that's kind of scary. I think we're gonna have a lot of uh, um, accidents trying to make that happen along the way, but maybe we can engage other things. Maybe we can even um, be able to, uh, what Neuralink really wants to do. And I think companies like Valve are trying to do with their own VR headsets is trying to use EEG and brain frequencies to actually be the, the form of input. So forget controllers, but actually think you're moving forward and you move forward in a VR space. Um, that's maybe even a more exciting way of how um, Neuralink might be able to be intersecting with VR. Uh yeah, I totally agree that before before we before hijacking uh, the brain by coming inside with electrode and and trying to interface to, to interface it with uh, with uh, with electronics, we can or we can just try to, to recruit our sense by external uh, device such as uh, headphones and and other things that can stimulate our sense. It's enough to you know to to recruit our brain. No, no need to go inside with with electrodes. I totally agree on that. It's a little bit. Uh, let's say uh, scary to, to think about what mm. Elon Musk is doing right now um, but who knows what uh, the future will be uh, let's let's talk about also about your fundraising because for any startup is a very crucial uh, any innovative startup is very crucial and very important so you you raised uh, from pre c to seed stage uh, for virtually a total of 1.4 Four million dollar, right? Right. I read on Crunchbase, but it's never accurate. But uh, I don't know if it yeah. is. Is it right? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, you know, we we never lie. Uh, on no, it's things. not you. It's just you know the the the, the delay between the, what what journalists uh, you know. Right. Uh, no, actually, our Crunchbase profile is managed by us. Okay. So we 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 manage it like any other social media platform. Whenever an article comes out, we put it up there. Um, I don't put events on there because the event organizer just fails to put in events into the system so I can plug it in. And it takes too much work to add that in. But pretty much we try to put articles, signals, make it something that obviously the more we keep it up to date, the more we are attractive to investors that are looking at our, are looking and observing us. Um, the 1.4 million isn't like a single round. We've been, we've been in getting investment through safe agreements, a form of convertible notes um, without a maturity date or, or interest rate um, in a rolling fashion. So ever since 2018, we would introduce our first safe agreements at that you know, token 5 million valuation cap, and then just increasingly um, update the terms as we brought in more investors that were interested in participating in, in our growth. So um, 1.4 million to date in, in external funding and about 260,000 in non-dilutive non capital. So the grants that we've applied for and won in Europe and the US. About four or five months ago, we brought on board uh, someone who leads now our partnerships and grants. So we expect uh, the, the non-dilutive capital side to be more, uh, more uh, explosive in, in the coming year or two. Uh, where, where we actually, you know, seek out public funds like the EIC Accelerator um, here in Europe and, and other funds that are all the time being released by all sorts of public as well as pr uh, private entities. Uh, so your last round was uh, April 2022, right? For the seed, seed round. Yeah. Uh, it, it was uh, with the... Um... Well, I wouldn't call it a round again because it, oh. we, we, we just do rolling 
safe agreement. So, you know, someone's interested in investing, we give them the document with the terms uh, updated to our current status. So the valuation cap rises, um, typically a 20% discount rate is put upon it. Um, so, but that wasn't a round, that was, a, that was a, a single investment. Okay, okay, I understand. Because I wanted to talk about uh, the Silicon Valley based VC uh, in your in, in the in the in the investor name, Innovation Global Capital. Uh, so uh, it was interesting to see because uh, to talk about this because you know usually for early stage startup we always recommend to well, it's not a recommendation it's just the fact they can't raise money from too far investors because usually seed investors like to to have a some kind of eyes on where they invest. They, they like to invest sure. locally. So it was very interesting to see how you connected with this American VC and if they were different in their way of thinking, their way of challenging your business and their way of investing. But uh, okay. sure. But our, our parent company is US-based, you know? So okay. that's one. Two is we, we won that investment through Innovation Global Capital because we have participated in two equity-based accelerators in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and so the investment from from um, IGC came right at the end of the demo day of, of the accelerator in New York that we participated in oh, okay. called um, uh, Entrepreneur's Roundtable Accelerator. So, okay, you were there and you were pitching there. So, okay, it's not just, it's not, uh, you know, as you send a, a pitch deck through email, you know, to, to a Silicon Valley based VC. Yeah, you were there and you were pitching in a demo day. Okay, it's, you were physically there. This exactly. is important to say. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it is and it isn't. It all depends on so many things. It's like if you have traction mm, from sure. day one, then investors don't care mm. to some extent. They do care uh, if you're, you know, pitching an idea and then who are you and where are you? I mean, it makes all the sense in the world in terms of managing risk, right? Mm. Um, if you are making, you know, X amount of dollars month by month with a stabilized growth uh, rate and, and, and so on, and it all looks like it's really something that can be, you know, in their due diligence uh, observed as being accurate, then, you know, if you're making a, a lot of money, um, investors will jump after you. It's okay. when you when you have an idea that has no foundation in reality and you're living in a reality distortion field as all early stage, you know, startups are, then, then you're certainly correct. They already have enough deal flow in their country. Why should they look out uh, outside um, across the Atlantic Ocean, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so now, what is the next step for Virtulip? Uh, I mean, uh, do you continue, of course, your tech and product development, or do you have commercial expansion, a new product, new market? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're raising um, we're raising uh, funds probably by the end of the year in order to uh, go towards our U.S. expansion. Mm. Um, have an office there, uh, grow our team there. Um, a, a lot of our our focus right now is on finishing up this Roche pilot, um, you know, finishing up some of these projects and ventures that we have, uh, even the clinical uh, research projects that we have ongoing right now, the clinical studies, um, preliminary data, um, hoping to publish another peer reviewed paper in the coming months, really just trying to put things together in a way that our series A by the end of this year um, can be as strong and substantial as possible so that from then on in 2023, we can really start to be much more active in our most important market, which is the U.S. Great, great, great. Sounds, sounds very exciting. And we follow you closely on that to see, uh, to see the expansion of uh, Virtually because it's fascinating. And just uh, maybe a last word, if you allow me. Uh, I would say, uh, like any other technology, virtual reality, the metaverse uh, are not bad or good. Any tech can be used for a bad or for a bad thing or a good thing. And uh, it's the same with uh, virtual reality and metaverse. Uh, people could use them to, to watch porn and trade NFT mon of monkeys or use them to become a better version of themselves and do virtuous things for other human beings. And I think what you do is very precious and very important. Um, that's why uh, we were very happy to have you today with us. Uh, do you agree with my philosophical ending? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> everything is a, is a double-edged sword. Um, you know, you could treat phobias with VR and you can equally create phobias with VR. So any technology with any power uh, in the wrong hands or in the reckless and ignorant hands can, can have all sorts of unforeseen negative consequences that I think uh, society has to always be prepared for and proactively, um, you know, uh, compensate for with people who are on the other side 
um, observing, anticipating those kind of issues and making sure we're, we're all trying to make it as ethical and safe as possible. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Amir. As a conclusion, maybe you would like to share for us uh, something that inspired you recently, a book, a podcast, anything you want. Ah, uh, well, that's a, that's, you know, um, I have nothing that comes to mind except uh, some of the companies that are, I'm watching myself, you sure. know, quite in this space, you know, um, uh, you're, you're watching right now a period of time in which VR is being adopted by you know, a lot of different companies and, and it's kind of still being tested. But one of the coolest areas that we can see that it's really, really getting mainstream acceptance is in areas like surgery. So of surgeons course. are using VR. Um, I want to talk to you about that. Just sorry to, to interrupt you, but you know, for me, uh, the fail of the Google Glass, is was, it was because of the arrogance of Google. You know, they wanted mm. to, 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 to attack very hard everybody on the planet but if they stick to their first initial uh, intuition, you know, of, uh, targeting a very specific niche, the, the surgeon, today, today, 10 years after the fall, you know, the, the fail of the, of the Google Glass, the Google Glass would be a mainstream device. So you're right. Uh, targeting the surgeon is, is a very um, important and very promising niche. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really, it's an area that is really getting a lot of traction now. Um, so very hardcore uh, use cases where you enable um, people in very high stress roles to test um, and train uh, in conditions that engage their autonomic nervous system in such a way that their muscle memory actually benefits from the virtual environment. Like, let's say Axon uh, is another company in the US, the creators of the Taser. They, um, they have a very compelling um, portfolio of XR solutions for training police to be able to better manage high stress environments in which they will be less likely to make um, you know, uh, unfortunate mistakes because they weren't in that environment. Um, and those environments are predictable. They follow a pattern. And in VR, we can create safe environments in which that kind of exercise can be done in a safe environment, a laboratory setting almost, but also gives that police officer the you know, muscle memory, so to speak, um, of that environment before they're suddenly surprised with it unexpectedly in the real world and something like an accident happens. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Uh, and thanks also to Tahare. She had to leave uh, for, for a meet for another meeting. Thank you very much, Ahmed. It was very great to have you. And what you do is precious. I strongly believe that you will change, uh, you will change everything in this business and you will contribute to make our spaces a better spaces. Thank you so much for having me, Ari. Having, a, having a shared your space, I really appreciate your enthusiasm and, and thank you again for having me.